baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6.3-6. 6, 3 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Would you welcome the man of God with a hand right now? And everybody said, praise the Lord. I've always thought somebody's going to get up in a preliminary and say, boy, I really enjoyed hearing Brother Huntley three years ago preach this sermon, and I'm sitting there thinking, that's what I was going to preach tonight. <laughs> but there's something special about people that love the Word of God. And there's something special about the Word of God. One of the greatest attributes of Pentecostalism is not necessarily the movement of the Spirit. It is, it is our high regard for anointed preaching. If you want to know what makes a church what it is, it's the liberation and the empowerment of apostolic anointing that fills a pulpit. And the unfettered, unchained, freed liberty to preach the Word of God. I pray we never reach a place in the apostolic church where our ministry is regulated by a board or a group of men who purview our messages and tell us what we can preach and can't preach. That day comes, we won't be able to hear from God. Also, another practice of mine in traveling and preaching, I've never allowed pastors to tell me what was going on in their churches. I don't want to hear that. Because if you tell me that, I may have been going to deal with that, and then I'm confused about what God said and what you said. I like to be able to come unfettered, unprejudiced, and just preach what I feel the Spirit is saying to the church right now. And that's what I'm going to do tonight and tomorrow night. And I'm thrilled to be here. I love all you ministers that are here. Good to see Brother Corn, Brother French, Brother French. The French Revolution is on in Georgia, I see. And of course, Brother and Sister Cole. Iconic figures in Pentecost. Brother and Sister Cole. You've heard of the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Cole. The reason I hold such high integrity for them in regard is when I was 13 years old, living in Charlotte, North Carolina, and my dad was in prison. My uncle, who was an apostolic preacher, asked my mother, said, can I take Wayne to Georgia with me to a camp? They're having a camp in Georgia. I'll take full care of him. I was 13. I'll, I'll provide his finances. I'll be sure that he's taken good care of if you'll let him go with me. I was 13 years old. Brother Cole prayed me through to the Holy Ghost in Georgia. <laughs> Doll Spears was preaching that meeting. Years later, I went to Mississippi to preach the camp meeting there. He had no idea who I was, never had met me. I told the story of how he was preaching that youth camp, and I got the Holy Ghost. His wife said from that day until the day he died, he prayed for me every day. And I was privileged to preach his funeral. So there is a great, great heritage and tradition and love for the church. I thank God for what he's doing in the apostolic movement right now. I am a, a proponent of the fact that I do not, no offense to anybody, never have, and don't plan to start liking cotton candy. Never have. I never did like it because you pack your jaws with it and when you're ready to chew it and enjoy it, there's nothing there. I don't like cotton candy church. I don't like cotton candy preaching. I like preaching that you can get some of this to go home with you. You can take it to the house with you. And I really appreciate biblical principles 
that can guide and direct our lives into victory and into the good things that God has for us. I'm sure that you were blessed last night by Brother Van Lu and cohorts of Brother Harvey, these friends of his, uh, very interesting young men. I thank God for our young apostolic ministry. I'm trying to get used, Brother Corden, to the fact that I have become an elder. That's tough for me. I've all, I, the fondest days of my life, Brother Harvey, is when they introduced me and said, we're glad to have this young preacher here tonight. Let's help him preach. Because the term young preacher covered a multitude of ignorance. And now they expect a little something when you come to the pulpit. That young preacher day is long gone. Tonight, I would like to present to you from the book of life, the manual for successful living, a principle that when applied can save your marriage, save your job, save your family, save your relationship with God, and save your relationship with your church. It will prove to be a source of spiritual success, stability, and serenity for 2014. I feel the Lord has allowed me through the telescope of prophecy and spiritual intervention to understand what's coming in 2014. And I want to prepare all of us and be prepared myself not to be distracted by the adversary in the greatest year God is going to ever give the church. We are poised and positioned for the greatest year of revival, evangelism, and church growth we have ever experienced. We are poised for that. But wherever there is a great door of opportunity, there are many adversaries. And we have to enter into this year with our eyes opened. Please open your Bibles to Genesis 14 and 41 and 17. If you'd like to stand, please do so. Genesis 41 and 17. I like to run with all these young men. It keeps me young. I have reached a dimension where the, all of my friends are younger than me. I kind of like it that way. Genesis 41 and verse 17. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. Genesis 41 and 18. And behold, there came up out of the river seven kind. I don't mean to offend anybody. I represent this statement, but fat-fleshed and well-favored. Those were Pentecostal cows. <laughs> the Bible said the liberal soul shall be made fat. The Bible said the fat belongs to the Lord. <laughs> you want me to keep preaching? <laughs> fat-fleshed and well-favored. That's the Pentecostals. And they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean flesh. That's the kids of the devil. And he said it was so bad, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. It was the worst that I had ever seen. Now notice this unusual event. And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the first seven fat kind. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them. But they were still ill-favored as at the beginning, so I awoke. I paused to inject this commentary, having nothing to do with my message, but I'd like to share with you as a Pentecostal. You don't want to ever be spiritually categorized as those that were ill and lean because they consumed the good and you could never tell they had eaten it. The tragedy of Pentecostalism is to come to church and consume the good and walk out and never appear that you had consumed anything. It is necessary that we not just come in here and enjoy this, but that it affect us and that it impact us and that it changes us. 
Verse 22, and I saw in my dream, behold, seven ears came up in one stalk full and good, and behold, seven ears withered thin and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears, and I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. I can declare it to you by inspiration of the Spirit tonight. The challenge for the church in 2014 is simple. Don't let the bad eat up the good. Don't let the bad eat up the good. Turn around to somebody and shake their hand and say, don't let the bad eat up the good. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The private interpretation of Pharaoh's dream by Joseph would be the secret of Egypt's survival and eventually the saving of the known world. The interpretation of Revelation would allow Egypt to survive and continue during the devastating famine. I want to preach to you Pentecostals tonight that God has a plan for your survival and your continuation. Is there anybody here that intends to survive and continue in your walk with God. Our story tonight, our narrative tonight, will let us know that it's all contingent upon you how you handle the good. It is predicated upon your appreciation, your evaluation, and proper administration of the good things of God. As Pentecostals, we must learn to maximize the positive and minimize the negative. The worst thing that could happen to this church right now is to get cynical, critical, and negative. For all the promises of God in Him, they are yea and they are amen. This is an hour where we need to be positive about the favor and the blessings and the goodness of God. Clap your hands and celebrate God's mercy in your life. Somebody shout yes. Now as a young pastor, I can tell you I've graduated. I haven't learned it all, Brother Cole, but I've learned some. And some of it I learned through the school of hard knocks and, and experience. I tell people that come into the Temple of Pentecost now, the church that I pastor, you picked a good time to come because when I was 28 years old and became the pastor of five people, you may not have wanted to be there then because I'm not exactly now what I was then. I was juiced up, fired up, and had a small fuse. And if it stuck its head up, I hit it. <laughs> Any ill spirit that come in that church, it wasn't going to be there long because I was on it like a duck on a June bug. And sometimes I was greatly distracted by some of the things that came around and came in and came through. During my time of frustration and seeking the will of God for personal peace and power to pastor that church, God showed me this verse of scripture that I share with you tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. In a great church, it's not going to all be gold. In a great church, it's not all going to be silver. But in a great church, there's going to be vessels of wood and earth. And in a great church, there's going to be some to dishonor. I want to preach to you tonight that the Bible, the infallible truth of God stated, it may have some dishonor in it. It may have some normality in it. It may have something that's not shining like gold or valuable like gold. But God said, it is a great house. I got to convince somebody tonight, your church may have its problems. Your church may have its imperfections. Your church may have its limitations. But I preach to you, don't be deceived or distracted. It is a great house. Clap your hands and shout, my church is a great church. My church is a great church. 2 Timothy 3 and 1, the Bible said, In the last days perilous times shall come. Everybody shout bad days. 
Joel chapter 2, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Everybody shout, best days. So as we view 2014 and we view the Bible, we need to understand that the last days will contain both perils and pearls. The last days will contain both perils and pearls. But let me tell you something about your God in the event that you haven't noticed. And this is why I love him so. He loves to do the best of things in the worst of times. Where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit's going to raise up a standard against him. So I preach to you tonight, don't let the bad eat up the good. In the epistle, Paul tells us how to love and how to live. But equally as important, and I think this is very important for Pentecostals, he tells us how to think. Now, Pentecostals are good at living, they're good at loving, but sometimes they, they have stinking thinking. Now, I am one, so I know what I'm talking about. Our biggest battles are not spiritual, they're mental. Do you know that when God poured the Holy Ghost out on the day of Pentecost, where did he pour it out? He poured it out in the upper room. You know where we need a baptism today? In the upper room. We need to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost out of our heart and into our brain. We need some sanctified Holy Ghost, Word of God brains so that we won't only live right, love right, we will think right. Philippians chapter 4 and 8, Paul tells us how to think, what to think. Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true. Matter of fact, if you if you read the book of Philippians, let me pause long and I'll preach fast. But if you read the book of Philippians, I love the fact that three or four times Paul said, finally, that encourages me. He said, <laughs> he said, finally, three or four times. In other words, he thought he was through and something else came. <laughs> kind of reminds me of us. I got one more point, church, five more minutes. <laughs> Paul said finally about four times in the book of Philippians. He thought he had come to the end, but the Holy Ghost was burning in him. And he said, I got to tell you one more time. Finally. Matter of fact, if you don't like long preaching, you didn't like the day of Pentecost because the Bible said of Simon Peter. And with many other words, <laughs> the whole message is not recorded there, but it said, and with many other words, I'm going to try to be concise tonight, but finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. In 2014, it is going to be imperative that we don't let the bad be your discussion. Don't let the bad be your definition. Don't let the bad be your domination. Don't let the bad eat up the good. Don't walk out of a Holy Ghost service where 15 just got the Holy Ghost and fuss about the air conditioning. Or fuss about the PA set. Or fuss about the choir. We need not to let the bad eat up the good. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells the story of a man whose debt was massive. He was on the verge of seeing himself, his wife, his children sold as slaves. And everything he owned sold to pay the debt. His debt was, as I have studied, to be an equivalent amount of $10,000. He fell before his master and pled for patience and time. His master was moved with compassion and I like the way the Bible worded it. It said, he loosed him and forgave him. He loosed him and forgave him. I wish somebody would know that when God forgave you, he loosed you. He loosed you. When he forgave you, he not only forgave you, he freed you. I said, we're not only forgiven, our sins are forgotten. 
His master was moved with compassion, loosed him and forgave his debt. The same servant found a man that owed him the equivalent of $100. He had been forgiven of 10000 He met a man that owed him 100 When his debtor made the same petition, the man fell on his face before this one that he had fallen before as he had done and said, give me time, give me patience. He grabbed him by the throat and had him thrown into prison and said, you will stay there until you have paid it all. How can it be that you would let the bad $100 eat up $10,000 of $100 of debt compared to $10,000 of forgiveness? $100 of wrong, $100 of bad compared to $10,000 of good. I'm getting ahead of myself right here, but I need to remind somebody in this church tonight. No, not everybody in the church is going to be perfect. Not everybody's going to be what you think they ought to be. No, everybody in there is going to be like, as a matter of fact, not everybody's going to be angels. But you know what? We don't need to be angels because my definition of an angel is something that's up in the air harping all the time. An angel is something up in the air harping on something all the time. But I do think we need to remember that God forgave us of $10,000 worth of debt. And we should be able to forgive somebody of 100. Now when the Lord of the forgiven heard what the man had done, he was wroth. And the Bible said he delivered him to the tormentors. Nothing upsets God more than us letting the bad eat up the good. The reason some sit here today and, and are not at peace, don't have happiness, and are not comforted, although they have been forgiven, is because they have let the bad eat up the good. He said, I'm going to deliver you to the tormentors because you have not done what you need to do and you have let the bad eat up the good. I'd like to liberate everybody in this room tonight from your judgmentalism, from your criticism, from your fault finding, from your gossip, from your self-righteous, from your hypocrisy, and realize God's forgiven me of so much, I have no right to condemn anybody. I wish I could get a witness here tonight. God has been so merciful to me, I have no right to judge anybody. Turn around to somebody and say, don't let the bad eat up the good. Don't let the bad eat up the good. Don't walk out of church tonight and only talk about the bad. Let's talk about the good. Let's remember the good. Let's praise God for the good. Let's celebrate the good. Let's keep our eyes on the good. Let's keep our hearts on the good. Notice this, in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar makes a decree that it would affect the whole kingdom because of three men that wouldn't bow down. I don't know how many was in that kingdom, but it was thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. But he regulated his judgment and his executive power because of three men. Just three, everybody say three. three. Out of an innumerable people in his kingdom. He is blinded to the obedience of the masses by three. Just three in the whole kingdom. And instead of celebrating the good, he was transfixed on the bad. And I just read it afresh so I'd be sure to get it right. He ordered the furnace to be fired up and heated seven times hotter than it had ever been. And ordered some of his strongest, bravest men to throw the Hebrew boys into the fire. And what freed the Hebrew boys killed the mightiest men in his army. He lost some of the mightiest men in his army because he could not deal with three that would not bow down. Everybody say three. three. Just three. Three would not bow down. It, he made an executive order. He, he ordered his old king. I want to pause on and say this to you. 
Don't let people that do not matter order your life. Don't let people that don't love you order your life. Are you with me? Don't make your decisions based on what that devil's going to think. I've seen pastors bow to spirits in their church and succumb to spirits in the church. And it was people that weren't loyal, didn't love God, didn't love him, didn't give a dime to it. I'm not going to let those kind of people dictate what goes on in our church. And I'll tell you something else too. I've learned as, as I've grown a little older. This is where I made my mistakes as a young preacher. I've been and I've heard others. I've heard guys preach and preach be like me tonight preaching tonight. I tell you what, it's a shame in the Pentecost church. People won't go to church tonight. People don't come to church. People ain't never. I don't know where everybody's at. Should be here tonight. I don't know why they don't come to church. It beats me. I can't understand all why folks don't come to church. And it's pound and pound and pound on church absenteeism while you're sitting there. Hey, don't preach to them. They're here. I ain't going to waste my breath telling you all to go to church. You're in church. Let's wait till those folks come back and save that message for then. Let's celebrate the good and not let the bad eat up the good. I ain't going to let two folks here tonight that are not saying amen make me mad. I ain't going to try to get two or three folks that ain't dancing to dance. Sit there if you want to, but it's good to praise God and I'm not going to let the bad eat up the good. I'm going to have revival if they don't want it. We're going to have revival anyhow. We're going to praise God anyway. Don't let the bad eat up the good. I want to say something to you pastors that are here. Sometimes you can have a little element in your church. It, it governs everything, dominates everything, dictates. Close your eyes to them. When I used to evangelize, I, I, I developed a habit. Because when I started evangelizing, I was 19 years old. And I traveled all over the place. And a lot of places where I'd preached, the only person I knew was my wife. And so I developed a habit of watching my wife while I preached. It was a friendly face. If you ever want to know why preachers preach in certain spots, that's a light spot. You want to know why they don't look certain places? That's a dark spot. <laughs> I'm looking for some help up in here. I don't get any help out of them sad looking faces. I don't get any help out of them folks back there grunting and groaning, looking at their watch, like how much longer, how much longer. <laughs> now, however, when my wife went up under the pew and said, oh, Jesus, I knew we were in trouble then. <laughs> Even worse than that is when you're preaching, somebody starts going, help him, Lord. Oh, God, help him, Lord. That means you're in trouble right then. <laughs> I refuse to let the bad eat up the good. Let me tell you a quick little story here. I hadn't been in Raleigh but a few years. True story, that makes it even better. When I got a call from St. Louis, Missouri, from my, it went from St. Louis to my district superintendent, Brother Jesse Williams. Brother Jesse Williams called me, and he said, man, you must be having a revival. I said, yes, sir, God's blessing us, man. I was a young pastor. Yes, sir, we're having a great revival. Appreciate you calling me. He said, well, you may not appreciate it when I get through. He said, I got a little business to take care of. He said, there's been a charge filed against you in St. Louis. A lady in your church has called St. Louis protesting your ministry. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, she called, and I got her name. I knew who it was. He said, she called and said, y'all need to come down here and check this young man out. He's telling people how to live. <laughs> He's telling them how to dress. He's telling them where to park. And you can't even get in the parking lot. It's full of cars. I think you need to come check him out. I think he's a dictator. I knew, I got the name of the lady. I knew who she was. And so I thought, how am I going to deal with this? After that call, I got another call from St. Louis. I was getting popular in St. Louis. 
They said, we have chosen your church to be highlighted on the national CFC film strip. Your church will be spotlighted all over America. You're going to receive CFC support. It was, it was phenomenal. So I'm teaching a Bible study down front one Wednesday night shortly after this. And I started saying, and here, here was my honest opinion. I, said, I didn't know how the church would respond when I told them, we've been selected to be on the national face of this organization. Everybody's going to know about this church. You, our church is going to be in every church in the United Pentecostal Church. They're going to see our film strip. And so I didn't know how, I didn't know whether they even should tell them or not. I thought, will they get proudful? Will they get haughty? Uh, will, what, what will happen as a young pastor? I didn't know whether I should tell them or not. So I said, I got a call the other day from St. Louis, and I was referencing the CFC thing. Well, that woman was sitting right over there. <laughs> See, she didn't know that I know. Yeah. I'm not going to let the bad eat up my good. That's right. That's right. So I just ignored her. And I said, I got a call from St. Louis, Missouri, and I was going to tell them about the CFC thing. And when I looked over there, she just blowed up, boy. I'm like, hallelujah, this is it. They're coming to take his license. It worked. My phone call is going to shut him down for sure. Here they come. And she was, you can see pride swelling up in her. I got him. And so she kept getting so big. After a while, she was like an inflatable filling the auditorium. I mean, that's all I could see. She just blew up. And when she did that, I thought, ooh. I wasn't even thinking about it. We're going to have some fun here. <laughs> so I just backed up and stepped dragging it out. I don't know how y'all going to do I don't, man, I'm scared to tell y'all this. I just, and boy, she just, I, I, I don't know this is going to be good or not. I just don't know. What, it may ruin me. I don't know. I don't know what I ought to tell you. Not. She, and I waited till she reached to where she was filling the whole room. And then I stuck a pin in her. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, We've been doing so good here that we've been chosen to be CFC missionaries. And she was like the wicked witch. She melted almost out of sight. In a puddle of water. Brother Cole, that was 32 years ago. Every service now, on Sunday morning, she comes up to me. That was great preaching, Pastor. That was a wonderful message. I love you and appreciate you and your family. She doesn't know that I know you tried to kill me. <laughs> she doesn't know I know you tried to ruin my reputation. But I made up my mind. I ain't going to let the bad eat up my good. I ain't going to let the bad eat up my good. You need to make up your mind tonight in 2014. There's going to be the best of days and there's going to be the worst of days, but I'm not going to be distracted and I'm not going to let the bad eat up my good. We serve a great God. This is a great church and we're having revival. For 32 years, I shook her hand and hugged her neck and told her I loved her. And she had no idea that I know you tried to ruin me. 32 years. I made up my mind. I ain't going to let the bad eat up my good. I ain't going to let. I want to say this just in moving by too. Gossip ain't spiritual. Gossip is not one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. Suspicion is not one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. God didn't put you in this church to sit back there and be suspicious of everybody. I, said, I think he may be doing this. I think she may be doing that. And I'm not too sure about this. And I don't know about all that. Come on, somebody. Don't let the bad eat up your good. There's a lot of good in this church. There's a lot of mercy in this church. There's a lot of grace in this church. Clap your hands and say, I'm not going to let the bad eat up the good. I'll just throw this in and I'll quickly go back to preaching. <laughs> if you've been married for quite a while, don't be derog derogatory or detrimental or be meaning to your wife if she's gained a few pounds. I wish some of the ladies would help me preach right now. 
Because in case you ain't looked in the mirror, you ain't exactly Charles Atlas yourself. You mean, well, my wife, you know, right? Yeah, you, you need to lose some weight, you pig. Well, in case you ain't noticed, your six pack turned into a keg. <laughs> this is getting nutty tonight. Eh? And by the way, I'm saving somebody's marriage right now. I'm saving somebody's marriage right now. You don't need to let the bad eat up the good in your home. He may not be Mr. Handsome and he may not be Mr. Personality, but if he loves you and he, he makes a living and he comes home every night and he's faithful to you, don't let the bad eat up the good. And besides that, Brother Cole, I had a preacher say one time years ago and I, I locked it in my memory bank and I'll tuck it in right here. He said, you ladies, said you... You say to your husband, scat, cat. He said, there's a lady around the corner saying, he, kitty, 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 kitty. I wish somebody helped me preach right now. I wish somebody helped me preach right now. You don't need to let the bad eat up the good. This is a great church. We're wonderful people. We're blood bought. We're spirit filled. There's not another place like this on earth. You need to celebrate the good. Twenty fourteen at its conclusion. Where you will be, how you will be. What you will be will be determined by what I'm preaching tonight. Because good is going to come to all of us. Bad is going to come to all of us. And you got to make up your mind what you're going to do with it. You must not let the bad eat up the good. I talked about three ordering a whole kingdom. Let's get it more refined and I'll quickly move on. How about Esther 3 and 2 where the Bible said that Haman wanted the whole kingdom to bow before him. Only one man, just, just one, would not bow. Haman got so out of whack. He paid no attention to everybody else bowing. The only thing he could see is one that wouldn't. Now let me help some pastors here. I heard, I've, heard, I've heard pastors say this. Man, we had so many at church and if everybody would have been there. Hear me when I tell you, forget it. Everybody ain't going to be there. You're living a dream. Wake up. Well, if everybody would be there, it ain't going to happen. It didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, we're going to launch the New Testament church. It's going to be a worldwide campaign. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened. 500, above 500, heard him say, go to Jerusalem. But when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was only 120 there. 380 didn't show up. If I'd have been God, I'd said we cancel the program of launching the church today. If they're either up at the mountains or down at the beach, it's not a good Sunday. I didn't realize it was a vacation time. I think we better wait till more. Let's wait till the weather gets warm. <laughs> Three hundred didn't show up. I don't know where they are. Everybody say that was Jesus. Three hundred eighty out of five hundred didn't do what he asked. They didn't show up. And if he couldn't get a hundred percent participation, what makes you think you can? Jesus couldn't get everybody there. But I tell you what he did. He said, I'm not going to let the bad eat up the good. I'm going to pour out my spirit because I don't need everybody. I can do it with whatever shows up, whoever shows up. Come on, pastors, don't cry about those that don't get on the wagon. Don't cry about those that don't get involved. Take what's left and have revival.
One Jew named Mordecai refused to bow. Just one. And the end of the story is this. Haman is swinging from the gallows he designed for Mordecai. (laughs) You know why he hung on his own gallows? Because he would not, could not refuse to let it go. Sometimes you can't do anything about it. You just got to let it go. If you hang on to it, it's going to bring personal disaster to you. Let me say this quickly and I'll move on. You know, bitterness is drinking poison, hoping it will kill your enemy. Somebody said if you're in the woods and you get bit by a venomous serpent, you've got one or two choices. You can get so mad you chase the snake down and kill it. And while you're running through the woods, you're sending poison through your body. Or you can calmly get in your vehicle and drive to a physician. Now when you get bit by the circumstances of life that are unfavorable, you can run and get your revenge. But while you're speeding after your revenge, you're pushing poison through your body that's going to kill your soul. Or you can just go find the great physician and fall at his feet and let him heal you. Somebody shout, let it go. Everybody's been done wrong. Preach with me now. Everybody's been done wrong. Everybody's been misunderstood. Everybody's had problems. Everybody's been overlooked. Everybody's been passed by. But you got to let it go. I conclude with this. Genesis 42 and 9. Oh, I love this. Shoo! I love it. I love it. And Joseph. Check this out, Brother Cole. And Joseph remembered the dream he, it seems that there was a period of time intoxicated by his elevation inebriated by his promotion high in the kingdom wealth and prosperity and prestige he forgot why he was even there. But when his brothers came and he saw them, he didn't remember them stripping the coat. He didn't remember them throwing him in a pit. He didn't remember them throwing him, selling him to the Ishmaelites. He didn't remember them putting him in Egypt. He didn't remember Potiphar's wife lying to authorities and having him innocently put in prison. He didn't remember a man that he gave an interpretation to, I believe it was the chief butler, and saw him restored to his position. And that man, the Bible said, did not remember Joseph. Joseph said, I only got one qualification. I'm going to tell you how to get out of here. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in your life. I'm only asking one thing from you. When you're restored, remember me. And the only thing he asked, he didn't do. Joseph did not remember any of that. All he remembered was the dream. (laughs) Don't remember the bad stuff. Don't focus on your life of failures and all the things that's gone wrong in your life and everything that's disappointed you. It's time for somebody to revisit your dream. Revisit what you used to feel in your heart and your mind that God was going to work in your life. Don't let the negative steal your your dream and put out your dream and tarnish your dream. Don't remember the brothers that did this to me and they did that to me. Remember this. You meant it to me for evil, but God meant it for good. Don't let the bad 
eat up the good. And because of that, Joseph saved his own people. If you focus on the bad, you concentrate on the bad, you emphasize the bad, you're going to be lost in your whole family. But if you can stay focused on the dream and not let the bad eat up the good. You may have legitimately been hurt. You may be right in the fact that you were mistreated. I may be trying to defend something that's defenseless. You really did get wrong on the deal. But I heard a unique story here a while back. A friend of mine is a pastor in Texas, but he's also a professional fish guide. And he said he was guiding a, a man fishing one time in one of the lakes in Texas, and they were up in a slough fishing. And this guy was going to cast his reel, and the boat rocked, and he fell in out of the boat and fell into the water. And he was flouncing and fighting the water, and he was screaming, I'm drowning! I'm drowning! Help! Help! I can't swim! And the guide, my friend, said, stand up. The water was two feet deep. <laughs> That's right. Come on now. <laughs> stand up. <laughs> and he stands up and the water's right here. <laughs> In the spirit, I hear some of you screaming, I'm drowning. Help. I can't swim. Stand up for heaven's sake. All you got to do is rise up. Everything's going to be all right. It's not over your head. You're not in treachery. You're not in danger. God has got it all in control. But you must not let the bad eat up the good. Now you can sit here tonight and hear the little funny stories and a few little illustrations and go home and say, it's all right. But I'm telling you, somebody in this room tonight is going to live or die on the power of this message. You're going to go from marriage to marriage and marriage to marriage if you don't hear the message. You're going to go from job to job to job if you don't hear the message. You're going to raise kids that are not going to love God and love you because all you talk about is the bad they do, the bad they do, the bad they do, the bad they do. And you're driving them from God because you let the bad. Yeah, every, there's no perfect kids in the world, but there's no perfect parents either. But don't let the bad eat up the good. You don't need to hate every man because one man. You don't need to hate every church because of one church. You don't need to hate every preacher because of one preacher. Reach over to somebody beside you. Their, their soul is in jeopardy tonight because somebody has got to make a New Year's revolution. I refuse to let the bad eat up the good. Touch somebody right now and say, God, in the name of Jesus, I refuse to let the bad eat up the good that's in their lives. I refuse to let the bad eat up the good. I'm not going to let the bad eat up the good. I feel the Spirit ministering to somebody strongly right now. Take them by the hand and pray for them. Don't let the bad eat up the good. Lady, you don't need to let the bad eat up the good. Yeah, you got done wrong. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah, it was bad. But there's a whole lot of good. Don't focus on the bad. Put your eyes on the good.
We need to pray some more. There's somebody in this room tonight. If you don't hear this word, you're going to let the bad eat up the good. You're going to destroy a good situation. You're going to bring devastation to something that could have been great blessing. If you don't quit focusing on the bad and start focusing on the good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and call on the Lord tonight. And say, God, help me to think correctly. Help me to think right. Sanctify my mind. Put me put in me the mind of Christ. Help me to think right. Don't let the bad eat up the good. Hallelujah. Sir, why don't you take your wife's hand and together join in our home. We are not going to let the bad eat up the good. We're not going to let the bad eat up the good. God's been good to us. God has been good to us. We're going to celebrate the good and ignore the bad. I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. Somebody would like to walk to the front tonight for prayer. Saying, I need prayer. The bad has been arresting my attention. The bad has been dominating my mind. I want deliverance tonight. I want to I want to resist the bad and celebrate the good. Don't let the bad eat up the good. I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. I will bless. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.